Hello, everybody, and welcome to Craftsy Chats. My name is Leah, and I am here today with Colette Christian. She is our baker. She is here to answer all of your questions, and I'm going to start right away by just asking, Colette, it's only been a few days since you and I have done one of these events together. How are you doing? Leah, I'm doing great. That was so much fun on Thursday. I hope people enjoyed it. I sure enjoyed putting that class together, and I, I was really happy with the way the the uh, Penne de Pasqua turned out, and I hope everyone had a great holiday. Yes, and we are going to be answering your questions all throughout the time we have today with Colette, but also if you had a chance to try out that recipe, we would love to hear how it went. So you could drop a comment into the chat box about that bake if you would like to share your successes, maybe your lessons learned, <laughs> anything fun that you got into with that project, we would love to hear about it. Um, but that being said, we are gonna dig into some questions. We'll get to as many as possible. So if you have a question for Colette, go ahead and drop it into the chat box and I will start asking those questions right away. Are you ready to go, Colette? Of course, ready, <laughs> all set. All right, let's start with the first question that came in. This one comes in from Anne. Hello, Anne. Uh, Anne says, I make Madeleines pretty often following the recipe and usually they are perfect. This time I did everything the same, refrigerated my batter for two hours, no bump at all, perfectly flat. Why? I did nothing different. Hmm. Well, let's just, what causes that hump is that we, you, the fat in the recipe is chilled so that the steam, the steam lifts the, how can I say this quickly? The chilled batter hold, stops the fat from melting too quickly. So we, the burst of steam lifts, lifts the batter. Um, Madeline's can be a real pain when they don't, when they don't, when you don't get that hump. So it's not the chilling. Two hours is fine. Could, I would be concerned about the mix. Two things. Is your, is your oven heating consistency? And is it possible that you may have overfolded at any point? in those last couple of batches. All right, so a couple points where maybe we lost the bump in the Madeline. So hopefully that's a little, a good starting point for the next time that you give that recipe a try, Anne. Uh, if you have any more clarity that you wanna add, I'll keep an eye on the chat yeah. box for you as well. <laughs> and then we'll move on to Joe's question next. Uh, Joe says, hi Colette, thanks in advance for your help. Scones can be spongy. If I want them to be more crisp or brittle, how would I change the ingredients? And if I want crisper cookies rather than softer ones, how would I change those ingredients? Much appreciated. Joe, bake them longer. What you wanna do is draw out excess moisture. So oftentimes the, the recommended baking time for scones is, is, well, not enough time to really dry out the excess moisture. And so I would add another five to seven minutes to the bake. The, the, you could remove a little bit of the liquid, but I don't like that. I know, I know in my baker's heart and, and all the research and all the thought I put into this, add more time to the bake and cookies too. One thing you could add to that cookie recipe, if you want them a little crisper, you could add a quarter teaspoon more of baking powder if there is baking powder in the recipe, or if not, just add a quarter teaspoon of baking powder because baking powder, it's, it's a clue, everyone. If you're searching through cookie recipes, if you see a cookie recipe with baking soda, it's going to be on the soft side. If you see a cookie recipe with baking powder, it's going to be on the crisper side. So try that, Joe. Longer bake on those scones and a little baking powder and longer bake on those cookies. Now there's a comment that came in. I'd love to get your take on Colette. Uh, one of our- That's half the time I'm using parchment. 
I like to use the sill pad because it's more environmentally friendly. And then, and also just as a practical note, I don't have to worry about running out of parchment. So that's a win-win. As far as crispness goes, sure, if it works and you have one, try it. The one thing about the sill pad, above 400, 425 degrees over repeated uses, higher temperatures will wear out the sill pad more quickly, but they sure work fabulously at 325 and below. All right, and I'm just gonna reiterate because we had a quick little glitch. Mm -hmm. That was Colette kind of talking about using a sill pat in, uh, in an attempt to get a little bit more of a crispy finish for cookies and things like that. So if you were wondering where we got onto that topic, that's how we got there. Uh, thank you for covering some of that. Um, we're gonna move on to what was my next favorite question that I saw. Susie, you're out there challenging my pronunciation today. So let's go with this one. <laughs> Hi there, I love Queen Amon. Do you have any ideas for types of fillings or variations for these? I had one in San Francisco that had a cream cheese blueberry filling that was amazing. So first Colette, let me know if I got that correct with my pronunciation and then you can go on and give Susie some advice. Leah, that was perfect. So cream, you did, you did a great job. So cream cheese, so fillings for Queen Amon, um, in my crafts, in my class, Advanced Flaky Pastries, there is a lesson on how to make Queen Amon, and, and maybe Susie, you have seen it. And they really, really are delicious. And I talk about fillings in that lesson. The blueberry cream cheese sounds really magical. And if you wanted to recreate that, I would recommend using cream cheese filling before baking. And then when they come out of the oven, then add your blueberry filling. And for blueberry filling, just a good quality blueberry jam, like um, like uh, the company that comes immediately to my mind is like Bon Maman, you know, the, the French jams with the red and white top. They're pretty much mainstream in every supermarket. That would, um, I think that would be delicious. I don't know if you need to go to the whole thing of making your own blueberry filling. Good quality jam. I'm all about... I'm all about quality time savers. Um, so that would be my recommendation to recreate that San Francisco Queen Amon. Lemon curd is a great filling. Nutella is delicious. And remember, we can make curds out of other things besides lemon, raspberry, passion fruit. Oh, could you imagine a passion fruit Queen Amon? That would be just amazing. So you could do any kind of fruit curd, cream cheese, blueberry, Nutella. Um, I don't know. I just had a wild idea to even do like a, a, a s'mores Queen Amon with a little bit of bittersweet chocolate so it wouldn't be too, too sweet. Then maybe a little graham cracker streusel and then a little marshmallow on top which you could caramelize with your creme brulee torch if you have one. I don't oh, know, wow. just spitballing here, Leah. I'm spitballing. <laughs> Lots of great ideas right off the bat. So try some of those out and let us know how they go. We would love to hear. Uh, we're gonna move away from the Queen of Mon now and into yeast. Our next oh. question comes in from Cheryl. So Cheryl says, re yeast, should I be using premium high power yeast instead of the usual safe instant in my bread or rolls? Is the premium only for a faster rise or is there any other reason that I should be paying more for the yeast? That was from Cheryl, right, Leah? Yes. Oh, Cheryl, welcome to our yeast hour, everyone, sponsored by SAF Yeast. I'm just kidding. Um, that's a great question. I don't like the fast acting yeast. I never use them. So yeast works quickly no matter what. One single cell of yeast will go from one cell to a trillion in just a very short amount of time. What the fast acting yeasts are, they're marketing ploys to make us bake more and think, it, I don't know, I think, Maybe the yeast companies haven't gotten the memo 
that fast-acting yeast is so 2020. We have plenty of time, and yeast works quickly. So use your SAF regular yeast, unless you are making sweet doughs like we made on Thursday in our live class, then what I recommend buy SAF Gold. And the SAF Gold yeast is an osmotolerant yeast. So what that means is when we're working with, with doughs that have a higher sugar amount, more than 5% of the overall formula, then the sugar will fight the yeast for moisture. What the osmotolerant yeast does is it on the molecular level, acting kind of like a bouncer at a club, it holds back the sugar so that the yeast can hydrate first. Now, now you guys are probably thinking, oh my God, is she telling me to have two kinds of yeast in my pantry? No. What I do, what I recommend you do, if you're making a variety of yeasted doughs, buy a bag of the gold yeast. And if it's a regular dough, then it works just like regular instant yeast. And you can use it for everything. Now, the fast acting yeezes, ye yeezes. <laughs> the fast acting yeezies, no, that's, that's shoes um, and a person. Uh, the fast acting yeast, they add enzymes to the yeast to make it work even faster. And it's really not necessary. So that was super long winded but I could talk about yeast for hours. And one last thought, I don't begrudge the yeast company. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to, to talk smack about the yeast companies. I mean, they, they, want to, they want to sell their, they want to sell yeast and they want us to bake, but um, it's not necessary. SAF Gold, SAF Red, Instant Yeast is super reliable and it's a great product. All right, let's move into brownies next. Oh. So our next question comes from Samreen. How do you turn your brownies recipe into other flavors? Nutella, for example. Ah, okay. So brownie, you, you have a couple options. You could keep everything normal. And then just when you've got the batter in the pan, you just drop dollops of Nutella and what you want to do is kind of take the Nutella and 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 soften it with a spatula so you can just so long story short you could keep your brownies the same drop your Nutella in take a butter knife or a cake tester and kind of marble it a little bit but the problem is Nutella is sweet your brownies are sweet so you might end up with a tray that is of brownies that's almost cloyingly sweet. So it, the easiest thing to do would be to um, use a less sweet chocolate, use a bittersweet instead of a semi-sweet and balance it out that way instead of upending your entire brownie recipe which you're probably happy with, that's what I would do to, to sort of balance the sweetness. And it's going to be trial and error. And when you're troubleshooting a recipe, cut it in half and do a half recipe. And that way you're not wasting or, you know, if, well, let's face it, you guys. With baking, it's really rare that we get a flat out disaster. It's usually edible. It might not be exactly what we want, but I find to cut the recipe in half um, is, 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 really, is really helpful when troubleshooting. And then cream cheese, that's easy. Just a good cream cheese filling dolloped on the top and swirled in. Again, I would use my regular tried and true brownie recipe 
and then just swirl the cream cheese, uh, then just dollop and swirl the cream cheese on top. And you could even get away with, you know, like maybe, uh, uh, I'm just, again, Leah, it must be National uh, just Spontaneous Thinking Day. Um, you could just get away probably with cream cheese, sugar, vanilla, and one egg, you know, and mix it up. Like, let's say six ounces of cream cheese, three ounces of sugar, one egg, half teaspoon of vanilla, mix, 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 and voila, you have a quick cream cheese, cream cheese filling to dollop on top of your brownies. All right, I'm about to go have to try some of these myself. <laughs> uh, let's move on to our next question from Emery. Um, I believe Emery's asking about macarons. They oh. make a nice foot, but then there's some struggles. They start cracking and are completely hollow inside. Do you have any advice as to what might be causing that? Oh, yes. So I wrote a book called Mastering Macarons, Classic to Contemporary Techniques. And I did a lot of research for the troubleshooting chapter because macarons were like my holy grail for many, many years. So the, the cracking comes from the macaron not drying out enough. So once we pipe, we want to sit them at room temperature uncovered, depending on where you live until the top looks dull. It'll be very shiny when you pipe them. And then as they sit, they'll go, they'll go from shiny to dull. Now, lots of recipes and blogs tell you to touch the surface of the macaron, but that's not necessary. If you poke one, you've lost it. So I just go by sight. Now, I'm at sea level, and I would say here, I'm based in Los Angeles, I've piped thousands of macarons here in LA, and it usually takes about 35 minutes for that shell to dry. Now, in I filmed the Craftsy class, French, dessert, French miniature desserts in Denver, and we were at we were a mile high and the macarons took about 17 minutes to dry. So where you live does, uh, that's a factor. Um, I have had many students right on the equator and uh, it took a little bit longer, but you never want to dry them more than an hour. So Henry, let them get too dull let them get to dull. And then the hollow, that's always air trapped somewhere in the process. Either the, the meringue was taken to too firm of a peak, too much air was whipped in, or at the stage that I call painting and scraping, not enough air was knocked out. So hollows are not in the bake they are in the mix and cracking. Well, if your oven was too hot, yes, they could crack, but 99.9% .9 of the time, that comes from just not letting that shell dry long enough. Okay, you mentioned meringues, and that is our next question from Tony. Uh, these may not be classically considered pastries, but when I tried to make meringues, the texture is still grainy and not very smooth. Do I need to use special sugar and not just cane sugar for the recipes? You could. CNH sugar sells a super fine sugar that has been recommended. They've been making that a long time and that's recommended for meringues. I have also, in trying that out, pulverized regular granulated sugar in my food processor, just getting it a little finer. You could try that, like it doesn't take long. You just put the sugar in the food processor and maybe give it like 
just pulse it for about 15 seconds and you'll get the, you, it's like a DIY super fine sugar. Um, you could try. Also, well, quick question. Are you, it sounds like you're baking, obviously you're baking these macarons or these meringues. Um, you could also try the Swiss meringue method where you, um, you warm your egg whites and the sugar over a double boiler to about 145 degrees. That will, maybe not that high. If, if, you're, if you're going to bake them, just warm the mixture enough to dissolve the sugar, then make your meringue, finish the meringue, put it on the mixer and, um, and then pipe and bake. I really highly recommend Gail Gann's Meringue Class on Craftsy. It is excellent. She goes in, she takes a deep dive into meringue. And Henry, you might enjoy that. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, all of those tips, actually. There's some great gems in there. Uh, we're going into baking a pie crust next. And this question comes in from Val. Uh, so Val says, when I par-bake pie crusts, they slide down the pan. I'm afraid if I put them in the fridge and then bake, the pan is going to break. No. I understand that fear. So Val, you must be baking in a Pyrex pan. I don't have the exact, I'd have to look it up on the on the Pyrex website, but it it the oven would have to be quite hot to crack that pan. And normally we bake pies no hotter than 400. So you're all right. Now, sometimes uh, they, they'll caution, of course they caution not to bake at too high a temperature because they don't want your, they don't, they don't want that Pyrex pan to, to crack. But I would guess you are all right. And refrigerating it, that pan has been tempered and tested and fired. So you, the problem is there's two things that can cause our pie crust to shrink. And they are rolling out the dough initially too aggressively. That's number one. Number two is not chilling long enough. So in many of my craftsy classes and in the tutorials that we've done live, um, in the past, in this, in the past year, you notice I do this really weird, it feels, it might seem weird to, to some of you, but I, when I'm rolling out dough, I will gently tap it with the pin to a half inch before I start rolling it. Because when we roll out dough, rolling dough activates gluten. And so what happens is when that gluten gets activated, I know we think of that only in yeasted dough most of the time, but it also happens in pie crust. So our gluten gets activated and then it's like with the gluten within our pie crust, it's like tight rubber bands. So then we keep rolling and we shape. And what happens is the gluten, and if we bake right away, the gluten has no time to relax. So that chilling in the refrigerator does a few things. Number one, it gives the gluten that we have activated in rolling time to relax. Number two, it causes the fat to chill, whatever we've used, butter or shortening or a combination of the both. Of, bo of both of them. So the fat chills so that when we bake, we put it in the oven and bake it. The baking processes are manipulated. So there's about seven baking processes and I won't bore you guys. I'll only talk about two. Chilling that crust helps the protein in the dough 
that comes from pretty much the flour, unless there's an egg in that dough, it causes the protein to coagulate before the fat melts out. So basically, there's a matrix that's created and set. And then when the fat melts out, we don't lose our shape. So nutshell, under 400, that, that pan is not going to crack. If it does, they will send you a replacement. Not gonna happen. Chilling's not gonna affect that process. Try not to, when you're first manipulating dough, maybe try my, my kind of, my tapping technique and light pressure, light pressure. Um, also too, before your final shape, I just remembered one more thing. Before you cut out that pie crust, pick it up and drop it. Let that gluten spring back. You'll see it. You'll be like, oh, that's what she was talking about. Wow. Sorry, that was long-winded. <laughs> no, that's what we're all here for, to get all of these little gems to take with us. So thank you for elaborating on that. Um, there's actually, in the comments, we're going to go through a few callbacks to okay. give you a chance to elaborate on some of the earlier answers that you are giving as well. Um, you struck a chord when you were speaking about curd back to the Queen Oman. So there is a question. First, a brief one. Lemon curd after baking is the assumption. Is that correct? Absolutely. Perfect. Because, and, and think of it this way, you guys. If your filling is fully cooked, then it's going to go in after. The cream cheese filling that I just whipped off the top of my head has raw egg in it. We need to bake that. So if you're ever faced with that, you, you, you're pondering that question, have I fully cooked it? Or do I have potentially foodborne illness, raw ingredients in it? Great. And moving right on from that into the passion fruit curd, that yes. also struck a chord. So do you have any uh, places that you could recommend to get really quality passion fruit, passion fruit puree? Yes. It's amazing. Goya sells a very, it's absolutely delicious passion fruit puree. I think it's, I, I know my supermarket has it. Um, it. It is not expensive. It's, it's a pretty good sized bag of passion fruit puree. They also have a few other flavors. I've never spent more than $5 on that bag of frozen puree. And it sounds like it might be time for a passion fruit curd recipe um, on my website. So I will um, put that, I'm, I'm working on a couple ideas for um, projects, but I, that sounds like that needs to, passion fruit curd needs to, using that Goya puree needs to go on to, uh, I need to get that to you guys. And if you're out there watching this and you have an idea of something you'd like to see, you can leave that in the comment box as well. Mm -hmm. And then we can look through those comments and uh, see what call it, what you're going to get up to next. <laughs> All right. We're going yeah, I, I have some fun ideas working, Leah. <laughs> we're going to go back to yeast. You said you could talk about yeast forever. Good. We're going to just do a little bit more about it. Uh, this is about that SAF gold. So does the SAF gold need water to activate the yeast? Because I think the fast acting yeast does not, but could be mistaken. Oh, I love this question so much. Okay. Okay. So instant yeast, when it was, instant yeast was developed in France in the 1970s. And it was, it really hit our market in the 1990s. Um, I wasn't quite working in culinary schools yet. I was in the industry. And I remember when it burst on the scene because it was such a game changer for us. And the reason it was a game changer is because it could go in with the dry ingredients. So that fast-acting yeast 
is just another form of instant yeast. The granules are as fine as instant yeast, but they have added enzymes. As I said, there's enzymes added to it to cause the yeast to actually feed off the starch in the flour quicker. All right, kind of like I'm, um, I'm having a, a seven, I mentioned the 70s. Picture Pac-Man. So the enzymes added to the yeast make that go quicker. But as I said, it's already going really quick. So when, so the SAF gold can be added with the dry ingredients. Absolutely. But if you're working with a yeasted dough that is not a high hydration dough, all right, um, let's say if you can see the baker's percentages on your recipe, it's at 50%. I really recommend hydrating instant yeast in the liquid before mixing your dough. Now I have a very esteemed colleague. This chef is one of the best in the world for viennoiserie. And he, his name is Peter Ewan. He's on Instagram. His work is amazing. And I have studied with him and no matter what, Chef Peter hydrates his yeast, instant yeast, and liquid. All right? Even though we don't need to. So you're probably asking, well, what if i am really gotten used to throwing everything together? And, and that's fine. But what you'll notice it, it, what you'll notice in a lower hydrated dough, and I'm talking bagel, challah, sweet dough, um, pretzel. If there's not a lot of hydration, the yeast cannot move around very freely. And it's the yeast being able to move around that dough, that dry yeast that we've added in, that dry yeast, if it can't move around freely like it can in a focaccia or a ciabatta, a dough that's more highly hydrated, then sometimes, you guys, there's a little tiny pellet of yeast. It's super tiny. It's kind of like the princess in the pea in her mattress, but maybe it's just because I'm such a baking lunatic I can see it. So that's why I recommend nine times out of 10. And again, after studying with Chef Peter, because I wanted to take my, my laminated dough to the next level, hydrate, the ye hydrate even instant yeast in the liquid five minutes. Five minutes. All right. Wow. Before I get into the Again. next question, uh, just dropping a quick reminder. Um, if you just joined us or you weren't with us at the very top, you can check out the chat box, not just to ask your questions for Colette, but also we have a team behind the scenes that any of the classes that Colette has mentioned, if there is a link to those classes, you can find it in the chat box. So if you're curious about anything that Colette has mentioned, our live from last week with our sweet bread, the Easter bread, that was the braid around the eggs, that's in the chat box. Uh, the class that she had mentioned about the miniature French desserts, you can find that in the chat box as well. So when you're done with today's event, you can click on through and check out those courses as she mentions them. All right, yeah. that's Go ahead. I just thought, I thank you so much for that. I thought of another one. Ooh. I talked a little bit about baker's percentages and about hydration levels, and I was kind of getting a little technical. In Jeffrey Hamelman's French bread class on Craftsy, he does break down baker's percentages. If you're curious about what I was talking about and you want to take a deeper dive, I recommend 
taking a look at at his at at Jeffrey's class. He is an amazing instructor and baker, and it would be well worth your time. So definitely check those out if you haven't already. And keep your questions coming. Like I said, we'll get to as many as possible, which means we're going to move right into our next one as well from Alana. Uh, Alana has a really simple question, but I'm excited to hear your answer, Colette. Where do you find the best fresh ingredients? Oh, wow. Um, the best, I, I buy my ingredients all over. And since, since COVID, I've been relying a lot on online sources. That's a really good question. Um, wow. Times have really changed. So I, Alana, I, I guess, and, and I, I just, I really keep my eyes open more than I used to. And, and I look for, for sources that maybe pre COVID and pre lockdown and pre this year that we've all been living through, I wouldn't have necessarily looked for baking ingredients for. And, and one of them was the dollar store. I found an amazing flower from a mill in Utah at my local 99 cent store. And that was at the time when there was no flour on the shelves because, because everybody, I guess, was trying to bake sourdough bread. So I don't have a really good clear source any longer. A year ago, I would have rattled off a ton of bougie sources, but mm, I'm not that girl anymore. <laughs> Well, I'm not a pastry chef expert by any stretch of the imagination, but if you're talking about fresh ingredients that are more garden grown, Colette mentioned COVID. I can speak to, at least in my neighborhood, I know that the number of yard gardens in my neighborhood have expanded mightily in the last year. So maybe you have a neighbor too that might be growing some herbs or growing some things and they might end up with... Um, a lot more than they thought that they were going to end up with. So you might be able to just check out your neighbors as well. I know I've been the beneficiary of a few overambitious gardens this year. Oh, Leah, that's an excellent idea. So let us know if that's you too. Maybe uh, if you're watching, you've started a garden of sorts and maybe there's an ingredient that you really found you've been using in your baking. So if that's the case for you, you can drop that information into the comment box, get a little crowdsourcing going as well. The one that comes immediately to my mind, it sounds like we have several, we have a, a several bread bakers in the audience, Leah. The, if you grow anything, grow a nice pot of rosemary for yourself, right? It's so easy and it's pretty, it, it doesn't take a lot of maintenance. Oh my goodness. It's so nice for the top of a focaccia or, you know, knead it into a bowl. That's my recommendation. Oh, that sounds, that sounds fantastic. I like that as a start. All right, let's go into another question here from Samreen. Uh, oh, Colette, you are a great instructor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> for Thank it. you. I, I, it's my mission. I want to make your baking lives better. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, Samreen is looking for some more advice. Uh, when we let Danish proof butter softens in the layer, some amount of the butter bleeds during baking in the oven. Is that normal? Um, no. I make your danishes. They're very tasty and worth the hard work. Um, but looking for a little advice on that. So, so a dough like Danish, um, once they're shaped and we proof them, that's you know that that second stage of carbon dioxide gas production where they lift a little bit. Um, we want to proof them at a cool temperature. So I think that maybe. Um, well, just make sure, like ideally 76 to 80 degrees. Um, and I know that in my Danish class, I use the big Ziploc bags that I love so much for proofing. And I recommend putting a cup of steaming water in there. Maybe if your kitchen is on the warm side, leave that water out 
and just let them proof covered at room temperature. And don't be surprised, it can take it can take an hour, it can take an hour, an hour and a half for croissants and Danish to proof. But if they proof too warm, then that butter runs out. Now, another thing that can happen, if the butter softens up at any point in the process, that can also affect that final outcome of the butter being on the, um, being on the baking tray. And if your kitchen is too warm, then proof them in a cooler part of the house. There's no law that says we need to stay in the kitchen. If the hall is, the baking police will not come. Um, if, if another part of the house is cooler, then just move the tray in there and just let them take their time. I hope that helps. Yes, and a follow on while we're talking about danishes as well from Samarine. Can you please tell how to cut Danish dough from whole to part? Cut Danish dough from whole to part. I guess I need a little bit more clarification. Is that cutting the block of dough? Usually I would use a bench scraper to cut it. I mean, you can use a knife, but we, we try to usually avoid cutting dough with a knife. Um, and then, you know, uh, and then for shaping them, I usually use a pastry or pizza wheel. Is that answering the question? I'm not sure, Samreen, if you're out there and you would like a little fur further elaboration, just put another comment in the chat box and we'll come back to this one if you're needing a little bit more. Uh, but in the meantime, we can move on to another question as well. Uh, we've got one coming in from Brenda. Brenda finds an awful lot of cake and cookie recipes far too sweet. How much can I reduce the sugar percentage before the recipe no longer chemically works? Wow. This question, these, it, that's been a, it's, that's, it's a common question. I get it a lot with the macarons, in the macaron class. Um, mm, Brenda, you can take the sugar down 10%. But after that, things are going to start getting weird. So let's say, for example, your cake recipe calls for 198 grams of sugar. You take it down 10%, you're going to reduce it 20 grams. You'll be, you'll be okay. Um, the, what is affected by reducing the sugar is the texture. And also, you want to be mindful of the types of cakes. If you're making a cake where there's more sugar than flour in the recipe, that's usually called a high ratio cake. I wouldn't tamper with that. That higher sugar amount is very important to the cake's texture it helps it be really moist because sugar is not just about flavor. Sugar is a major tenderizer. It attracts moisture and it really helps our cakes stay tender. So when I tell you, or when I suggest, I'm really bossy today, I apologize. But when I suggest remove 10%, I'm thinking of a cake like a creaming method cake that has more flour than sugar in the recipe. That's my recommendation. Kind of depends on what type of cake you are making. Okay, we're gonna move on to a question. I believe it's Leah, but perhaps Lee. Sorry if I'm saying that incorrectly. Uh, the question is, I want to make beautiful baked meringue decor for my cakes. Rosettes, mm. is it shaped? Which type of meringue would you recommend for this, French, Italian, or Swiss? And what ratio of sugar to egg white? I would recommend Swiss meringue because I love it. I would also, again, recommend Gail's class because she, again, such a great deep dive into meringues. Um, I would not recommend Italian because when um, you cook the sugar and then you bake the meringues, they tend to get really weepy. I have to tell you, Leah, I'm having... Uh, I taught, I taught in at Le Cordon Bleu for 15 years. 
we would do like a week on meringues and I'm having flashbacks to weepy meringues right now. So let's nutshell this. Swiss and then um, low temperature, really, really be very patient with, with the bake on your meringues. Did I hit everything in that question? Uh, the ratio of sugar to egg whites was the other part. Oh, yeah. Um, usually it's two parts uh, sugar to one part egg white. That's pretty standard for a Swiss meringue across the board. All right. Let's and I wouldn't mess with that. And you know what's a really good if you're really I, – we, I feel, Leah, we've got meringue makers, which maybe we're, we're looking at a trend, you guys, which might be something to look at, right? And then um, we've got – We've got some bread bakers. So a really good exercise for my meringue audience is to just, you know, even buy some liquid egg whites so you're not, you're not ending up with uh, tons of egg yolks you may or may not use, just for this exercise. And play with sugar ratios and see what outcomes you get. And, and, and then it's, I think it really puts a little bit, it, it helps, gives us faith in what we read, like Swiss meringue, uh, two part sugar, one part egg white, you know, just, 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 just see, you know, maybe just see the differences. It can be really, really educational. Right. And just as you said that we were into meringues and breads today, we're going to take a little turn into cookies. So with our <laughs> next question, Teresa asks, when making chocolate chip cookies, I like them soft, but oftentimes the exterior gets brown, but the interior looks uncooked. So other than sending those cookies to me personally, Teresa, <laughs> how would you recommend that she fix this? Edges are brown. The centers are underbaked. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I would recommend is and cookies usually take anywhere between, well, depending on their size, anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes normally. At that 10 minute mark, well, you have a couple options. First option is to reduce the temperature 10 to 20 degrees. So if it says 350, you move the dial unless you can, unless it's digital, you move the dial between 325 and 350. Bake a little lower and a little slower. Maybe this, you know, my, my, <laughs> my ex-husband used to always say, it's a poor, it's, it's a poor artist who blames his tools or tradesmen or whatever. I don't want to blame your oven, but maybe the sidewalls do heat up aggressively and that that's what's there's there's a lot of heat on it sounds like on the edges. I would try just reducing the temperature and going a little bit longer. You know, it's it's really if we cover those cookies with maybe a piece of foil we're not going to get those centers. It'll take really a while for those centers to bake. So I would reduce the temperature. All right. Try it out and let us know how it goes. Uh, ooh, this is a good question coming in from Vivian. Uh, Hi, Colette. Do extracts go bad? I had a bottle of Fior de Cecilia in my kitchen drawer, and I'm not sure how old it was, but when I sniffed it recently, it smelled like chemicals and not the nice orange smell that it used to have. Yeah, they can. It takes quite a while. And then also, too, if they're exposed to light, that's why they're usually in like a brown bottle um, that can affect their flavor as well. So, yep, toss it, order a new one. Now, is the sniff test like that kind of the way that you would be able to tell? Absolutely. Your nose is not going to lie. Great. So no, no cooking with the chemical smelling <laughs> extracts. Replace and get a new one. Yeah. It probably wouldn't, it wouldn't make you sick or anything, just is going to, I mean, I can't imagine, um, it was just going to, would give an off flavor, yeah. 
All right, let's go to Eloise uh, for our next question. When I try to make a chocolate boiled icing, it comes out gritty. The process is to boil the milk and shortening for two minutes, then add the sugar, add two sugar and cocoa and beat until thick. So do you have any thoughts on that process and what might be causing the grittiness? The sugar's not melting. I don't know. It might be really, really rogue. But what? You boil the sugar, the shortening in the milk, dump the sugar in, just cook it long enough to dissolve the sugar, put that in the mixer with the cocoa, and continue mixing as normal because there's no way i think what they're hoping is the hot liquid is going to dissolve the sugar and that's not going to happen so if you dissolve the sugar like just put the sugar and it won't take long i mean literally maybe even the residual heat will melt the sugar and then back in the mixer and go. Try a half recipe or break the recipe down and try it. And I would love to know. I think that would work out really, really well. All right, we have two questions that came in back to back about freezing dough. So I'm gonna give them both to you. Oh, okay. First one is a little bit um, less specific, more about cutting. So if we want to use half of the dough and freeze the other half, then in which direction should we cut longitudinal or perpendicular? Long ways. All and right. then before you freeze it, flatten it out a little bit. So like it's about a half inch thick. That's one thing I really regret not taking the time to show in the laminated dough classes, because whenever we do a class like that, we're always time challenged. And um, so when you freeze your dough, cut it in half long ways, and then maybe take your rolling pin, just tap it out to a half inch, wrap it in plastic wrap, slide it in a freezer bag, and it will stay perfectly safe and sound for up to a month. Then, if it's thinner, a little bit thinner, it will thaw quicker. You could even, it, it'll thaw overnight in the fridge, no problem. Then when you go to shape that second half of your dough, you are not wrestling with a thick block of dough. Those okay. are my recommendations. Tammy's follow-up is a little more specific. She's talking about brioche dough here. Ooh. So if you're freezing brioche dough before the first rise, or should you only freeze it after shaping it and let it rise the second time? Okay, I've been thinking a lot about initial bulk fermentations. That's that first rise, everyone. So for your brioche, if you have time, let it come up let it bulk ferment at room temperature for an hour. Gently degas it, then wrap it and freeze it for a month. I do not recommend shaped brioche being frozen. You might see it commercially, but commercial frozen product, like, you know, there's companies like, and they're excellent, right? But they have dough conditioners and mold inhibitors and chemicals added to them to withstand freezing, transport, more freezing. So we at home have our best shot with freezing our rich doughs. Um, just if you, if you no, don't have time, mix it and throw it in the freezer. It will be okay. But if you can let it come up for an hour, gently degas, wrap and freeze, then at least the yeast has gotten a little chance to, to expand, to hydrate, to maybe get a little, you know, it's been able to feed off of the starch and the flour. Um, and then it goes to sleep in the freezer. So you'll have a better overall 
product, it impacts the volume of your final product down the line, whenever that is. Okay, we have a few more questions coming in. I'm gonna to try to get to as many as possible uh, in the remaining time that we have. Our first one is coming in from Jennifer. Uh, I discovered ermine slash cooked flour frosting a few years ago mm. and love it because it is not so sweet or as buttery as Italian buttercream. Do you have any other suggestions for frostings for her to try? There's about, again, I'm dipping, going back into when I teaching uh, in, in pastry school, there's about eight different frostings. There's, there's American buttercream, French buttercream, Italian buttercream, German buttercream, this cooked, the cooked frosting, um, and there's more. There is, if you, so it sounds like if, if you're making the cooked frosting, you've probably gone through Swiss, Italian, Swiss, Italian, French, American, um, there is a frosting that uses creme anglaise as a base. That's kind of crazy. You could look that up and try that one. But I have a feeling you are on, you're on a good path. And one, you know, if you like this cooked butter frosting, then just work with variations of, of maybe flavor and build yourself a little notebook, you know, and, 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 and so that you have a record. One thing that I think is we spend, since we have the internet and we have this glut of information, sometimes I think as bakers, and I'm guilty of it too, we spend a lot of time like looking for the holy grail of recipes when you may already have it. All right, let's get this last question in. This is going to be our last question today. So if your question wasn't answered or you're hanging on to one, just come back another time for another Craftsy Chat and we'll get to those when you, when you come back. So we're gonna finish with Katie's question. And Katie asks, when she freezes her croissant dough, when she's thawing, well, actually when she's baking, she finds that the butter runs out of it and it does not do well at all. Uh, do you have ideas of what she is doing wrong in that process of freezing, thawing, and then baking? I don't think it's in the freezing. When you have problems with the butter, it is usually in the laminating process. And, and it can happen. And it's it's that slippery slope with, with croissants. And I, I blanket apology for it. It can happen in butter incorporation. It can happen in turns one, two, or three. So, and it usually, butter incorporation is fine. We do the first turn right away, we're good. Then we have two and three. So what I recommend, add a little bit more chilling time um, in, between your, in between your turns. So maybe instead of doing 30 minutes, go for, give it another 10 so that butter's we don't want the butter to be brittle, but we also need it to set up. And our home refrigerators, especially if we live with other people who might be opening the door, they don't always, um, our dough doesn't always cool down. The coldest part of your refrigerator is bottom shelf toward the back. So maybe give it, give the dough 10 more minutes chilling time and make sure that the space you've cleared is in the coldest part of the refrigerator. And then maybe take a look at my newish, the newer croissant class I filmed last year. And in that class, we work in and out of the freezer to sort of um, take care of that problem of, a, of our home refrigerators not always being as cold as we would like them. All right, with that said, Colette, I'm just going to give you a moment to send us off with any parting thoughts you have for today. I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. We so appreciate it. I almost feel that we need a whole session just for yeast questions, and that would be so much fun. 
and uh, I just I want I hope that you enjoy your baking and just look for uh, new things happening on Craftsy because we're cooking up new content all the time. And before I let you go, once again, my name is Leah. Thank you for joining us for today's Craftsy Chats. You can check the chat box even now for all of the links to the classes that uh, Colette was mentioning as we went through. And until the next time, happy baking.